Well, thank you very thank much you. for that kind that. introduction. And I can't wait to call my husband to tell him that I was able to bump off some state legis some legislators <laughs> because he won't believe it. <laughs> um, but I was so privileged to be in this room. Um, the exciting things that you're doing in your states are just phenomenal. So kudos to all of you for making such a difference. Um, a couple of other th things that were of interest to me, I um, also served as the co-chair um, for Governor Rendell's Chronic Care Commission in Pennsylvania and now um, working with Governor Corbett's team. And it's just so um, interesting to learn from all of the other speakers of what other states are doing to combat this problem. Um, today, um, I'm going to switch hats and talk specifically about schools. And just um, for the nurses in the audience, my, my background is in nursing. I, I've been um, a nurse for 40 years. But the last 10 years, I've really spent um, time doing um, more research on how communities, how clinical environments, how healthcare delivery models, um, which we didn't really pay attention to so many years ago. Now it's really the hot button with accountable care, et cetera, et cetera. So my interest is really how do we start doing things like you suggested, bumping up the roles to take care of these enormous problems that we've got. I'm going to go through a lot of slides and then I can answer some questions at the end. Um, I'm a co-chair with Dr. Larry Deeb um, from Florida um, on the Safe at School um, Working Group with the American Diabetes Association. Make sure I go forward. And um, I'm sure you've already heard this, um, our mission statement from Dr. Anderson, but it's to prevent and cure diabetes and most importantly, improve the lives of people affected by diabetes. Um, if diabetes is a problem for adults, um, it's, and with all of the challenges that we've got going on in our, um, our country, we've got lots of kids with diabetes, and, and not only um, an epidemic with type 2 diabetes that we hear about a lot in the news, but we've got um, increasing rates of children diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Lots of factors involved in that, but that's a fact. And there's an estimated 75% of newly diagnosed cases um, occur in individuals under 18 years of age. We've got a dramatic increase in type 2 diabetes, um, the prevalence in, uh, because of childhood obesity and inactivity. I worked at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh um, for a very long time, and I can tell you 10, 15 years ago, we never saw a child with type 2 diabetes. And in some of our states, um, for example, Texas, and where we have um, large um, um, minority representation, the rates of type 2 diabetes are almost 50% of the diabetes clinics um, in those communities. And if any of you um, have been watching CNN and NPR, listening to it in the last couple of weeks, there was a huge study, a national study, the results were just released and will be presenting at the American Diabetes Association, that kids with type 2 diabetes are harder to treat. And the aggression and the progression of their treatment is much, much more aggressive. So these kids that we're diagnosing at age 10 and 12, the rates for amputation and blindness and kidney failure when they're in their early 20s. I mean, this is part of the epidemic that we need to be thinking about. But when it comes to safe at school, you know, traditionally all we thought about were kids with type 1 diabetes. When I heard that message about advancement of treatment in kids with type 2 diabetes in the schools, what that meant for me is these kids are going to be needing insulin faster. So we're not going to be waiting 10, 15 years to put them on insulin. It's going to be much quicker because they require aggressive treatment. And there's improvements in technology and knowledge um, that have enabled better care and a lot of self-management. And I kudos, kudos to you um, folks in our government who recognize the importance of diabetes education because with this epidemic, self-management is absolutely critical. Um, the goals for our um, diabetes care working group is that schools must provide a medically safe environment for students with diabetes. Students with diabetes must have the same access to educational opportunities and school-related activities with their peers. And we need to support the child's transition to um, independence, which is very um, critical. And ADA supports the goal of full-time nurses. I mean, I, I can't say that any stronger. School nurses are 
absolutely critical. But just like every challenge that we are having in our healthcare systems in, in this time is that we don't have enough of them. Most schools do not have a full-time school nurse. So when you think about these numbers growing, um, I would love to have a, 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 an associated number of school nurses um, being grown, but that's just not the case. Just like we don't have enough endocrinologists, there's a national shrinking of the number of endocrinologists. We don't have enough certified diabetes educators. The mean age is 54. So we have got to start thinking outside the box and thinking about strategies to help the people who are living with diabetes. And for me, one of the passions is, of course, kids. Um, and even a full-time school nurse is not always in all places at all times. I, I, I live in a kind of upscale um, school district, and I can tell you our school nurses are rotating. And we just found out with our budget cuts in Pennsylvania that our, our school nurses, many of them were let go. I think they let go about 80 to 100 school nurses, which caused a big um, article that happened in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And the needs of students with diabetes must be met during the school day because that's where they spend most of their time. And ADA supports a model that uses trained school personnel in the absence of a school nurse. If there's a school nurse, kudos, wonderful, we want that to happen, but we also want the school nurse to help us to help with um, identified people who can help children when they're not available. Um, We've done a lot of work with our federal agencies. I was just, one of the meetings that I was just at this week um, was um, at the NIH with the National Diabetes Education Program that has developed a document with all of our associations, including school nurses, that um, helps to outline what we need to do to help the student um, with diabetes succeed. And along with this tool that's supported by the CDC, the ADA, and many, many, many organizations. Um, the American Diabetes Association has developed numerous tools to help parents, to help teachers, to help school nurses so that we can do a better job in supporting our children during the school day. Um, and, but we need to also know what other things are missing. Um, I was just on a, a call this week with our team talking about what can we do to help support the schools and our, our school nurses, and just talking about kids who come from underserved communities, which is growing, and how do we help support kids in preschools that are in and daycare centers, because these kids not just require support, they need care. Um, we rally, recognize, and we've got lots of attorneys um, in the ADA who help us on discrimination cases, and what they said to us is, you know what, we can go in and help support families and children, but we need evidence. And any of you in the medical profession, I know some PharmDs and physicians, et cetera, in this room, everything that we do now has to be based in science. And so we have um, some uh, publications that have tested models where we have um, uh, trained, um, untrained people who help support the child and the school personnel. And this is a paper that was published um, on the Virginia experience. And currently we're doing a study um, in four states, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Texas, uh, Massachusetts and Florida, where we're looking at what, can, how are um, children doing in school, and is it based on the kind of supports that they have? So, hope we're pulling that data together so that we're armed with evidence base to demonstrate different models of supporting children. The Safe at School campaign, um, all school staff members need to have a basic knowledge of diabetes and know who to contact for help. The school nurse is the primary provider of diabetes care, but other school personnel must be trained to perform diabetes care tasks when the school nurse is not present. And students should be permitted to provide self-care whenever they are at school or at school-related activities. We've had lots of support from other health organizations recognizing that we've got to pull together, get other models, figure out ways to support children. Um, and many of these um, organizations you're familiar with. 
and the challenges facing students with diabetes on the ADA in our advocacy um, office gets many, many, many phone calls um, for all kinds of diabetes discrimination and advocacy issues. But these are just um, some of the things that we hear. Um, failure to have trained staff to assist the students with diabetes, a school's refusal to administer insulin, um, and sometimes it's even just the school's refusal to help support the child when they're giving their own insulin, um, school's refusal to administer glucagon. When we talk about saving health care costs, when schools will not um, work with families in helping identify hypoglycemia in a young child and the response is so what would you do if a young child um, has symptoms of hypoglycemia? Well I would call 911 and so those of you with Medicaid that you're supporting and you've got an ambulance visit and an ER visit and that's what you're paying for I mean we've got to think about strategies other than oh gee, I'll just call 911. When treating hypoglycemia, I would bet that everybody in this room knows somebody um, who's had a low blood sugar and can be easily trained on what those symptoms are and what you should do. And, and, in state, and also saving the child's brain function. The longer that child doesn't have glucose going to their brain cells, the more damage is done. So we've got to think about these resources. Sending children to diabetes schools. There has been some states who um, put children on buses, um, long distances. Uh, so, and then there's the school bus driver responsible for the child. And they go to a diabetes school where there is a school nurse. Um, they, they're out of their neighborhood. They're out of their community, but they're considered special. And they have to go to a special school. And the school's refusal to allow a student to attend the school at all. And um, that's, that, those kinds of messages and calls come into the American Diabetes Association. Um, the laws to help achieve school diabetes care goals, um, you know, this falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act and specifically Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and um, the um, Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act. And now we're working on helping figure out how we can get state laws so that we can help um, with issues when they come up, like giving glucagon or having somebody be trained to give glucagon in the school or support a child giving an injection in the school day. And if there are specific questions on any of these legislative items, particularly in your own states, um, Ivan Lanier and Lisa are here um, to help answer those questions because that's what they do in their everyday jobs. Um, federal law requires schools to identify children with disabilities like diabetes, provide free and appropriate public education. So this is a federal mandate. Educate children with disabilities with other students as much as possible. Allow parental participation in decisions and we strongly encourage and have lots of tools available for schools to work with parents and medical health care teams in developing individual um, plans for the children um, who have diabetes. And provide children with disabilities with services they need in order to access equal opportunity to participate in academic and non-academic events and extracurricular activities. So lots of things um, end up um, in your own states um, with looking at state laws and regulations and how they apply and work um, alongside the federal mandates that are hovering over us. State and local laws and regulations. Um, we've got regulations with um, specific um, groups, for example, the Board of Nursing. Um, vary regarding who may perform various aspects of care. And back to your point on um, boards of nursing and just working to the fullest um, capability or um, element in your training, boards of nursing acts differ from state to state. You're allowed to do things in one state where you're not allowed to do things in another state, et cetera. Often there's no statewide policy. Rather, policy is determined by school district. Um, and oftentimes that's uninformed. Regardless of state and local laws, requirements of federal laws must be met, and school diabetes care legislation passed in states with legal barriers to implementing federal law. 
and Board of Nursing regulatory reform is happening in three states. So there's lots going on. We've got a federal uh, mandate with the Disabilities Act and lots of things happening at the district and state levels. Um, these are um, school diabetes care laws, and again, I'm just, I'm not going to go into specifics on what's happening in this map, but for you specifically, if you have a question about what is currently happening in your state, I'm going to, Ivan, are we okay if you answer those questions for me? And we um, have strategies um, from our ADA advocacy um, group. Um, we agree with you that the first thing that needs to happen on, at all levels, first thing is educate. We need to educate school personnel about diabetes and legal obligations. Um, if things bubble up that there's a problem, the next um, step in our process is to use negotiation and use resources that we've got at the ADA and national resources through the National Diabetes Education Program and a plethora of other um, tools and programs are coming out from industry partners. Litigate only if necessary. Um, and of, you know, all of you, many of you in here who are lawyers understand this more than I do, even though I'm married to a lawyer, um, it doesn't um, uh, disseminate into me. So these are all the processes that all of you are probably very, very well versed in. And then what we're always hoping for is um, legislation and policy um, if um, this helps to provide safe, um, safety measures for our children in the schools. Legislate, legislate, if educate, negotiate, and litigation isn't successful, and consider changing state laws or policies if current laws and policies do not provide students with diabetes the protection they need. And school diabetes care laws, regulations, or policies are enacted now in 28 states. And um, for um, the esteemed um, representative from Illinois, I do think now there are a few more states that are mandating payment um, for diabetes education. So I just wanted to add that when I had the opportunity. Um, state diabetes care laws allow school districts to train school staff volunteers, allow trained school staff volunteers to provide care when the school nurse isn't available. And we don't ask that anybody be forced to train, uh, be trained on diabetes. There are often many people within the schools who are willing. I've got a husband with diabetes. My niece has diabetes. I had a situation um, where I was doing a talk with school personnel and a, a coach of the football team raised his hand and said I was extremely upset. I had a football player on the bus. I was bringing them um, back from an away game. He had a hypoglycemic um, seizure on the bus and I wasn't trained on how to take care of it. Required a hospitalization, the ER visit, the whole thing and trauma to this, um, to all of the students, particularly the student with diabetes on that bus allow capable students to self-manage. Self-management is the key. Self-management is the key for everyone with diabetes because 98% of the decisions made about diabetes are made by the person who lives with it. And we need to start engaging children, which we do as, as soon as they're um, able to cognitively and developmentally handle the tasks and require the development of care plans, written care plans that are very, very specific. Uh, the parents want to be called when the child's blood sugar is this. Um, there's just all kinds of specifics that need to be negotiated between the school nurse who is key in helping prepare that plan along with the medical team and the child's parents and for older children, the child. Um, and diabetes care um, laws also prohibit diabetes um, school, schools in many cases. Um, and also provide immunity for schools and school districts, um, which um, in many cases we have to try to overcome. So having the appropriate legal protections in place ensures a safe and healthy school environment and optimizes the student's potential to achieve academic success, enables full participation in all uh, school activities, federal plus state law means safety, good health, and 
most important for all of our children in this country, academic success.